Good afternoon. It wasn't the scholar's fault after lunch. It was a little bit of a clogged elevator, so that's true. We had the clever idea of taking the stairs, and I'll be aspirating as I talk before you. <laughs> Mitt Romney has decided not publicly to discuss his religion during this campaign. He is not running, he notes, as pastor in chief. He does not want his church appropriated as a political football, either for his sake or for its. His silence is understandable, although opinions range at lunch and elsewhere this afternoon about um, the prudence of that strategy. Though more restrained than in 2008, um, suspicion of Romney's religion is alive and well. While the Romney camp remains silent on the matter, the public nonetheless want, does want to know something of what makes a potential presidential a potential president tick. The nation, since its beginning, has labored erratically to separate church and state, but it has not succeeded in separating religion and society. The public seeks answers where it can get them. People who look for how Mormonism may have shaped Mr. Romney commonly look at the movement's theology. Often they would do better to look at its history to which Mormons themselves often give priority. This is a point the Times' as David Brooks picks up on, drawing recently from a biography to trace the Romney family version of the 19th and 20th century Mormon exodus. Prior to Mitt, this was a four-generation saga, beginning in the 1840s, laced with mob attacks, pillage, exile without recompense from Illinois and then from the United States itself, Church leaders later called the Romneys to successive colonizing assignments in remote parts of Utah, Arizona, then Mexico, attended by poverty, malnourishment, and primeval living conditions. In each circumstance and generation, the Romneys survived, sometimes barely, then recovered, flourished, and were again called by church authorities to new colonies. Else they were banished afresh from their homes by hostile neighbors, their property forfeit, only to move and to prosper again. By 1907, the family owned a large and thriving ranch in Mexico where Mitt's father, George, was born. In 1912, when George was five, Pancho Villa and his revolutionary compatriots confiscated the family property and threw its owners out. Penniless again, the Romneys fled to California, then drifted to Idaho and Utah, where they built yet another fortune. Although Mitt Romney experienced none of this hardship directly, he is like a Jew who did not live through the Exodus, yet is still shaped by it. Character can take generations to form. Mitt Romney has character flaws, doubtless, in his line of work, observers will find them or will invent them. But as David Brooks points out, his flaws are not the type ordinarily associated with the soft and bloated rich basking in their ease and luxury. Romney's salient traits do not derive from his wealth. Rather, his wealth derives from his Mormon family's relentless will to rise. As Romney himself put it well before, as he himself put it well before his political days, Romneys are built to swim upstream. Along with political philosophy and talent then, character and one's record in enacting one's principles in public service is a more apt criterion than theology as one considers a candidate. It would be pleasing to see the retreat of religious prejudice in the political sphere. But surely, some suppose, a Mormon worldview so important and private and so important in the formation of a younger Romney would bear some influence on how a candidate sees the world and thus potentially on how he might act as President of the United States. On the public's behalf, reporters and pundits and vicarious rivals pose questions earnest or otherwise. Can we trust a guy who believes in angels and gold plates and wears funny underwear to be making decisions about Iran and nuclear brinksmanship? 
Should a person who believes he's going to inherit his own planet one day be influencing the budget for NASA? <coughs> this sort of question is generally posed either in fundamental ignorance of modern Mormonism or as political chumming, bloody rhetorical meat thrown into the political water to embarrass the candidate and attract the sharks. This level of query also lacks a feel for Romney's own way of being Mormon and for his personal history as a Mormon lay leader. As a private religious practitioner, Romney has never been a historian nor a theologian, nor has he much engaged the esoteric lore to be found in Mormon folk culture. His life as a Latter-day Saint bishop and state president was pastoral and pragmatic. As an administrator, as a solver of practical problems, as a builder of community and interfaith relations, as a resource to those in difficulty, as a counselor to those in grief. Other sorts of questions, when sincerely raised, are more plausible. Would a President Romney be obligated to follow Mormon leaders making national policy for America? Uh, if we have time later, we could discuss that. But in a word, no. Uh, the, the world's and the nation's media will would be um, on the job looking for any whisper of such relationship. It goes contrary to Romney's way of thinking and being and his track record in public office already. And it goes contrary to of official, very public and firm these days, LDS church policy. Another example of a question that <coughs> is of the sort that's perpetually being asked. Since Mormons characteristically believe in the possibility of personal inspiration, would President Romney await and claim revelation for every significant policy decision? The answer is probably not difficult. Like many US presidents, Romney is a praying man. Such a habit is apt to influence a Romney presidency as it did the Romney governorship. Prayer presumably occurred and it may have affected his attitude in pursuing his business or his professional responsibilities, but this was away from public view. It has been Michelle Bachman and Messrs. Perry, Santorum, and Kane, not the Mormon candidates, nor, so far as I know, Mr. Gingrich, who have recounted to audiences that God encouraged their presidential candidacies. As an example of the prospects and peril of trying to diagnose Romney's prospective or retrospective policy views in relation to his church's theology, I will explore for a moment the idea of American exceptionalism, a version of which Romney espouses. Not until Ronald Reagan's 1980s did the term American exceptionalism come to be used with anything resembling the meaning expressed by the current Republican candidates. The concept, however, has deep American roots. John Winthrop's famous 1630 uh, sermon about, aboard the Arabella in effect renewed the Abrahamic covenant between God and a chosen people brought to a chosen land their incipient Puritan community was to be a city upon a hill, said Winthrop. It must become a light shining abroad to the nations, forming an example and signaling that God's hand was upon New England. So chosen was this land that, a century later, Jonathan Edwards discerned it as the likely future place of Christ's second coming. The subsequent American century saw the rise of a new, experimental, different sort of nation, possessed of an exuberant sense of freedom and innocence and a destiny that was uh, um, more and more manifest to continental occupiers. Abraham Lincoln, despite his brooding, described the United States as the last best hope of Earth. In sum, the idea of America as a unique place with a unique mission has long held sway. During the last 30 years, American politicians have adopted the term American exceptionalism, which has come to mean in popular parlance that the United States is not only different from, but superior to other nations. It is the natural leader of the free world. By one um, 
recent count posted in the Huffington Post, references to this term in pre print media increased from two in 1980 to roughly 3,000 last year. The idea that America is chosen is also evident in Mormon thought. Reprising the Hebrew Bible's predominant motif, the opening narratives of the Book of Mormon, not, as I learned last night, the musical, tell of a prophet and his family who, centuries before the birth of Christianity, were led out of a hardened, corrupted Israel about to fall to Babylon and into exile. This prophet, Lehi, was to be led to a land that God had prepared for them, a land of promise, which is choice above all other lands. Prophecies in the unfolding story seem, to, seem specifically to allude to America's future, to the travails of Lehi's erring descendants, to the eventual arrival of Gentiles who, by God's might, emerged from their own captivity and were lifted in the new world above all other nations. The ancient prophet pronounces that there shall, be none, there shall none come into this land, save they shall be brought by the hand of the Lord. Wherefore, this land is consecrated unto them whom he shall bring. And if it so be that they shall serve him according to the commandments which he has given, it shall be a land of liberty unto them. Wherefore, they shall never be brought down into captivity. There shall be no kings upon the land. The Book of Mormon suggests that a special burden is placed on the inhabitants of America to obey God's commandments. Proclamations by Joseph Smith reiterated these themes. He added that the millennial New Jerusalem is to be built upon the American continent, and he pronounced the enduring Mormon belief that the United States Constitution is itself an inspired document. Later Mormon leaders have extended these teachings in the mid-20th century, in the face of severe communist threat, Ezra Taft Benson, about whom Jan Ships spoke earlier this morning, who was once Dwight Eisenhower's Secretary of Agriculture and later President of the United States, went so far as to speak of America as God's base of operations. Candidate Mitt Romney argues that Barack Obama's alleged lack of belief in American exceptionalism is leading the nation to decline and that this danger should define the coming election. We have a president now, says Mr. Romney, who thinks America is just another nation with a flag. President Obama seems to think that we are going to have a global century, an Asian century. Romney's own foreign policy contrasts sharply. I would be guided by an overwhelming conviction that this century must be an American century, where America has the strongest values, the strongest economy, and the strongest military. An American century means a century where America leads the free world, and the free world leads the entire world. Unlike our current president, I will never apologize for the United States of America. There is room in Mr. Romney's vision of the coming century for providence. This is a time, he says, where America has got to return to principles that will keep us the hope of the earth, remember Lincoln, and the shining city upon the hill, that biblical metaphor that Winthrop called upon. That light shining from that shining city has dimmed over the last three years, and I will help restore it. And as another example of um, the sorts of questions that are put to what I'm speaking about, I had a reporter call last week from Reuters um, asking about Mr. Romney's language about restore. I will restore America. I understand that Mormonism uh, that the restoration is a key element in Mormon um, thinking. Is it possible that there's any link there? Romney continues, God did not create this country to be a nation of followers. America is not destined to be one of several equally balanced global powers. America must lead the world or someone else will. And he has said elsewhere, 
it's entirely plausible that that someone else will not be nice people. Now, is it possible, if only at an unconscious level, that Romney's views of America's proper role in history is tinged with his Mormon sensibilities? It is, of course, possible, just as it is possible that President Obama's religion or his parents' divorce or his Hawaiian background or his experience in law school are strands that inform the way he thinks. But the limitations on this observation and hence um, on many of the questions as posed, the limitations on this observation are many and severe. His religion cannot be responsibly used to casually assess, much less to predict Romney's political decisions if he were to become president. One limitation is the difficulty of psychoanalyzing anyone, even on the nearby couch, much less a public figure based on press reports from afar. A second limitation is that, as we have noted, American exceptionalism has roots antedating Mormonism. If there exists a Mormon current in Romney's embrace of exceptionalism, it is an eddy in a wider stream. Other Republican candidates profess versions of exceptionalism with or without God. A third limitation is that Romney is a complex figure and Mormonism but one stream informing his makeup. His trumpet of exceptionalism might derive from his personal competitive drive, his faith in capitalism, or his secular patriotism as readily as his religion. A fourth reason for caution in assigning religious influence to Romney's thinking is that Mormonism itself is complex. Its notions of American exceptionalism are evolving and ambiguous bearing dominant and recessive genes. In the Book of Mormon, America is a land of promise until it isn't. The narrative tells of recurrent departures from peoples and lands grown degenerate in affluence, arrogance, injustice, and lust for war. There appear in the book a long series of promised lands and peoples who succeed or fail to live into their chosen roles. The overarching prophetic promise is one of demise and destruction if the nation should lose its moral fiber. Moreover, chosen rarely means exclusive, but instead chosen for a role, chosen for a mission. As one Book of Mormon prophet has God saying, know ye not that there are more nations than one? Know ye not that I, the Lord your God, have created all men, and that I remember those who are upon the isles of the sea, and that I rule in the heavens above and in the earth beneath, and I bring forth my word unto the children of men, yea, even upon all the nations of the earth? Furthermore, a central preoccupation of Mormonism for the past 40 years, amidst its vast international growth, has been how to shed its American presumptions and to function in diverse cultures of the world. It has been almost 20 years since most Mormons lived in the United States. Mormon growth predominates in such areas as Africa and South and Central America, and this has contributed, one might guess, to Mormon authorities urging US lawmakers to show compassion in formulating immigration policy. What any single Mormon politician might deliberately or inadvertently extract from this complex religious heritage as it applies to practical political policy is neither obvious nor inevitable. Mormons are not made from cookie cutters, as the new Mormon ads that have surfaced in Times Square attempt to remind us. The mere presence on the national stage of figures such as Or Orrin Hatch, John Huntsman, and Harry Reid should help make the point. None of this lends itself to easy assignment of Mormon thinking to Mitt Romney's philosophy of America's exceptional place in past and future history. As a final point, we should know that Barack Obama, despite his critics, also has spoken of American exceptionalism. His version is not based on our military prowess or our economic dominance. 
Americans, says the president, have a core set of values that are enshrined in our constitution, in our body of law, in our democratic processes, in our belief in free speech and equality that, though imperfect, are exceptional. The United States is to be a nation whose true strength comes from the enduring power of our ideals, democracy, liberty, opportunity, and unyielding hope and above all, a place of ceaseless innovation and an abiding sense that anything is possible. I believe in American exceptionalism, declared Obama, just as I suspect that the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. There is considerable overlap on the um, admiration between these two candidates of the American Constitution and the values that they hold, but there are sharp differences in emphasis. And it is worth noting that one could extract from Mormon history and teachings and scripture right reasons for supporting either Mr. Obama's or Mr. Romney's understanding of what makes America special. So the take home message Enough already with religious prejudice. History is more important than theology and character formation more important than doctrine in anticipating any influence Mormonism might wield on a Romney presidency. And finally, the idea that religious worldview might inform how a potential president would think about the world is not a silly notion intrinsically as one among other influences, but we would do well to be wary of inaccurate, simplistic, and confident diagnoses of any such influence. Religion may inform, but it does not presage this candidate's political choices. Thank you. Thank you.